Hey everybody, uh, my name is Chris Little with Why We Lead, and today I'm here with Major General Retired Robert H. Uh, Ladiff, author of Future Peace. And sir, thank you for being on the show today. I sure appreciate it. That's nice being here, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, uh, if you just want to kind of open it up and tell uh, people a little bit about yourself, your journey, um, when you started to write, uh, additionally, a little bit about your career. I'm sure people want to hear about that as well um and why you kind of chose to write this book so i'll hand it over to you okay um well first of all i'm from uh, rural appalachian kentucky you may hear some of that coming out in my speech uh, fortunate enough to uh be accepted at the university of notre dame uh, went there on a army on an army rotc scholarship awesome uh, and uh got a, a bachelor's and ended up getting a master's and a PhD in physics and engineering. Uh, was commissioned in the army uh, and immediately went into the infantry. Oh, okay. So I was, uh, actually I was sent to Germany where I served uh, on the Fulda Gap facing a hundred divisions of Russian infantry. Uh, and then I commanded a, uh, uh, Army Tactical Nuclear Weapons Unit in Germany. Uh, went back, taught for a couple of years at West Point, taught engineering, and was going to get out and go to work for NASA. And the Air Force <laughs> made me an offer uh, to do research on, on many of the topics that I'd already done research on. And uh, I spent the remaining 26 years of my 32-year career uh, in high-tech research, uh, ended up working in the Star Wars program, working uh, many classified space programs, mm -hmm. uh, commanding the Cheyenne Mountain uh, Warning Center out in Colorado, uh, and then ended up my career at the National Reconnaissance Office. Uh, and uh, so, uh, why did I start writing this book? So not long after I retired is when all the drone things were beginning uh, and some new technologies. And, and I began worrying about some of the ethics surrounding that. Contacted Notre Dame. They, uh, they said, oh, that's really interesting. Why don't you develop a course? Uh -huh. So I've been teaching a course at Notre Dame for the last 10 years, 11 years on the ethics of emerging weapons. Awesome. And uh, that led to my first book. And then maybe we'll talk a little bit about how I got to the to the second book. But uh, uh, so I started, I didn't think I said enough during the first book. So I, I figured that uh, with everything else that was following that, uh, I'd go ahead and, and write another one and finish what I had to say. Yes, sir. <laughs> Speaking of ethics, uh, do, can you go into ethics just a little bit as far as uh, warfare? Um, just tell a little bit about that, especially because you teach it from your perspective. Yeah. Uh, so the class I teach, what we so we begin by talking about uh, classic uh, ways of looking at, at ethics. So there's the, the utilitarian, you know, numbers versus numbers. Uh, uh, and then, then there's sort of the anything goes kind of thing. And then there's sort of something in between. So we teach the basic theories of ethics, Kantian ethics and deontology and yada, yada. Uh, but what I focus a lot on are the, what we call just war theory. So if anybody's still looked at, at that, there's, there's use ad bellum, which is justice in going to war. Then there's use in bello, which is justice in war. And then people don't talk too much about it, but there's use uh, post bellum, which is justice after the war. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talk about things like uh, right intention, last resort, proportionality, those types of things mm -hmm. for going to war. And then in war, Topics like military necessity and the protection of non-combatants and uh, not using weapons that are evil in and of themselves and those types of things. And then what I try to do is I try to take, those were developed back ancient times 
Yes, sir. Uh, uh, try to fast forward a couple of millennia and see how do those things apply mm -hmm. to the new weapons. Mm -hmm. And so we spend pretty much the rest of the semester working on, on trying to apply those things. Uh, yeah, that was pretty uh, apparent in your book as well, dealing with uh, technologies and second and third order effects that people might not realize. Um, and one of the questions I had, um, you know, technology might actually lead us to go to new wars fought with new technologies. Uh, what do you think the new threshold of war is? Because as you said, it's not thresholds are a lot different, I think, than they used to be, especially with like hybrid war, nonlinear warfare, things of that nature, uh, from diplomatic, uh, industrial, military, obviously, and then economic as well. Um, is it more in the gray zone now, do you think? Or what's our I, threat? I, I think it is, although not necessarily only in the gray zone or the hybrid, hybrid warfare. Uh, but to answer the basic question, I think the, the 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 barrier is very low now mm -hmm. uh, because we've decided we the, the russians and the chinese less but us and the russians we've decided that we don't want to fight each other in a nuclear war we don't even want to meet each other on the battlefield uh, we we have for years decades used proxies uh, and so uh, now that we've tr try to avoid major conflicts, we fight a lot of small conflicts. Mm -hmm. And given the fact that, that more, more now than ever, we can do it at a distance, not up close, Absolutely. then the, the barrier is, is a lot lower. And, and new technologies, drones being the primary example, mm -hmm. but cyber warfare being another example, uh, allow us to fight wars at a distance. And so the barrier is much lower. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. Uh, I wanted to touch a little bit on the small war versus large war. And you had talked in your book about uh, public engagement mm -hmm. as well as political leaders. Um, do you think uh, public engagement has been uh, hurt or has helped uh, going from a larger war construct to say uh, World War II to uh, the Korean War or Vietnam to wars of today, uh, like, as you said, fought at much more of a distance. And um, along with that, if social media has had any impact with that as well. Okay, we'll take those two different things. Well, the, the, the confusing part of the answer to that first question is that World War I and World War II and, and Korea and Vietnam uh, were number one, large conflicts, as you point out, uh, but they were also fought uh, with uh, conscripted soldiers. Yes, sir. So in all of those cases, the public was very much affected by those wars. They, they couldn't escape being affected by it. And as I point out in the book, you know, the number of, of military interventions that we've had since Vietnam is skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. But it's all been with a volunteer military. Yes, sir. And so those there are two trends there. Number one is you know who fights the war. Number two is who what the size of the war is. Mm -hmm. I, I think the fact that there are so many small engagements, many of which, by the way, uh, are fought with special forces and you know are not very visible. Yes, sir. So. Uh, most of the conflicts we're in, and, and unless they rise to a particular level, the American public never even really knows about it. Mm -hmm. uh, has social media um, helped engagement or hurt it or uh, skewed it, if you will? Uh, I think it's hurt it. Um, the, the problem with social media is that it's just that, it's social media. Uh, most of what goes over the social media is all you know what i had for dinner and you know, you know what i watched for on television and so it's it's pretty much mundane stuff and when it's not it's uh it, it's lies and conspiracy theories and and those kind of things so i i think it's it's taken the attention away from real 
important topics mm -hmm. and, and made everything a topic. Uh, it used to be that, I mean, pardon me, I'm a dinosaur, but you know, it, it used to be that you had to sit down and actually read a newspaper. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, now you can just kind of flip through page I, and I do it too but yeah and you had talked a little bit about um, people what they study in school as well and uh, enforcement of that from the states and the government um, you know do you from a civil learning about uh, governmental things in school uh, I know your view on it but if you want to tell mm -hmm. the audience uh, you know how, how do you think that has trended over the years as well Oh, I, I, it's, it's sad. Um, so many years ago when I was in school, uh, and really up until, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, uh, schools taught what we called it then civics. Some of them, some called it government. Um, but students, for the most part today, don't learn about how the government functions. Uh, you could pretty much ask people on the street, you know, what are the what are the branches of government? Many of them couldn't tell you, or how a law was enacted. We could get really complex and, and ask them how the defense budget is formed, uh, uh, and so they don't know any of that. Uh, and so, not understanding your government, uh, mm -hmm. and not even and really caring yeah. about how the government functions. And then, you know, fast, you know, move forward to the, to the college level, you know, people study political science, but uh, what passes for political science these days is, pardon me, is, is kind of a lot of a gobbledygook. It's a, um, people taking very, very detailed and, and uh, data-driven approaches rather than talking about the big issues. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and so it's more professors talking to professors than it is anything else. Uh, so I think the education system has kind of failed us when it comes to getting people to be interested in the way their government operates. Yes, sir, I would agree with that. Uh, additionally, just history of other uh, nations as well, like specifically, uh, you know, from military purview, uh, China and Russia and how important learning about their history as to what the actions are and why they are taking, you know, their approach to things the way they are today. And yeah. you know, it's as real today as it ever was, uh, in my opinion, especially uh, with China and their resurgency. Um, I, I do, I'm, I know, if you don't mind, uh, absolutely not, sir. Uh, I, I track a number of Nobel Peace Prize winners in the book. Yes, sir. Uh, one of whom is one who I just thoroughly enjoy reading about is General George Marshall, mm -hmm. you know, chief of staff of the army in World War II, uh, became secretary of state and won a Nobel Peace Prize for the Marshall Plan. And he was very much in favor of the study of history and culture of our adversaries mm -hmm. and, and teaching not just, you know, what we think, you know, but what they think, understanding what they think. Uh, to your point about Russia and China, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Even in the military today, it's kind of surprising how uh, few people actually really understand. Um, you know, I, I love learning about both. More recently, I've been delving into China a little bit more because the history kind of fascinates me with over the past 4,000 years. Uh, it, and when you keep talking about leadership and yourself, um, you know, how important is it to uh, read about things in life that you have not lived before and how important that is? Well, just remember now you're talking to an educator here. Um, <laughs> um, you I, read a lot of books, I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> Successful people, the commonality is they take time for professional development to realize. So... Um, one of the things that I, I did probably about the time I became a colonel or, or one star is I realized that my entire life and career had been uh, as a nerd and a geek. So all of my courses in college were all engineering and math courses. 
And, and so I set about as a senior officer to, to read uh, lots of things. So uh, lots of philosophy. Uh, in one of your questions, you asked about Thucydides, you know, Peloponnesian War and, and uh, Agamemnon and all, the, all of those things. Uh, and, and it is really amazing. And, and World War II history. Uh, you know, to, to go back and track the thinking of some of our senior leaderships as those battles unfolded. Uh, and to, you know, for instance, with the Athenians, you know, to delve into their thinking when they were, you know, fighting Sparta or, or the hubris that they had when they were, you know, decided to move into Italy. Uh, that's a very long rambling answer to your question, but it's a good one. It's a, uh, I think it is absolutely essential to read and, and not only read the things that you agree with. Mm -hmm. um, there are many things I don't agree with that I kind of just gulp real hard and read them anyway. It's fascinating. It's good to get another perspective as well and kind of yeah. open your aperture to how other people think as well. Yeah, but I do, what I, to end that, uh, as a senior officer, when I started giving talks to my engineers, I would encourage them to, uh, to read something else. Besides just math books? Besides just math books. <laughs> I, I got a, a general question for you, no sure. pun intended, but uh, how many senior leaders did you meet that never read a lot? Too many. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, there are really some really fascinating people. Uh, I don't, you know, like General Jim Mattis. Oh yeah, I read Mad it. Dog, Mad Dog Mattis, right? You know, it, his library is reportedly in the thousands of books. He's he's referred to as a monk. He reads all the time, uh, and I think a lot of the. The, the very senior leaders that I've dealt with, not all of them, some of them are still pretty one dimensional, but uh, many of them, uh, I think, do. Yeah. So, I mean, you'll see a lot of the chiefs of staff have reading lists. Yes. Now, whether they've read all the books on their reading list is another question. <laughs> um, and I think the ones who don't, you know, sort of get weeded out at the you know, lower levels. Mm -hmm. yeah i really uh you know you brought up mattis and i really enjoy mattis and um yeah, one of the the quotes that have stuck with me i'm paraphrasing here but you know he's he's like i've never lived every situation in life but i've always had a, a very uh faint light in any direction or any um circumstance i've ever been in because of my past reading and you can't help but think hey i'm not going to live in every circumstance that comes before me especially in the chaos of war and with new technologies coming up which i want to talk to in a minute but it, it's incredible just you know I, i'm probably not going to read seven thousand books like general mattis i just right. with kids i just don't have time but i appreciate the sentiment of being having that knowledge and just kind of living in somebody else's shoes vicariously and even reading your book future peace it's made me think a little bit more about um, ethics technology um, and actually that kind of leads me into a question um, you had talked about for advanced technology versus a sound strategy and uh, America is coming out with all these advanced weapons, but how does that look, uh, especially with the national security strategies you're talking about? It's trending more aggressively. Um, can advanced technology take place of a sound strategy? Never. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to look very far uh, to find examples of that. So Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We didn't. We didn't really have a strategy in Vietnam. We thought that with all of our power, uh, we could overwhelm the uh, Vietnamese, and, and we failed. You mm -hmm. know, helicopters. We took us everywhere. Uh, you know, we used we used chemicals. We tried to defoliate their whole country. Didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, Iraq. Remember shock and awe, right? We went in. 
you know, guns blazing, but we didn't have a strategy about what we were going to do when we got there. Mm-hmm. So, no, it, it can never take the place of an advance of, of a good strategy. Uh, and, you know, to kind of that point, one of the things that I talk about in the book, I've talked thought a little bit more about is, is how technology t- tends to seduce us. Mm-hmm. All right. The, the seduction metaphor is really strong because in you know, classic sexual you know, seduction, you know, it's a, it, it's a promise of something good. Oh, so overwhelms the thought process about what the, the downsides and the consequences are. Uh, and in technology, technology is, is objective. Mm-hmm. It's facts. It, it, it doesn't require you to think. And so I think those two things, that seduction, addiction kind of metaphor, along with the uh, uh, earlier two examples, or yeah, the answer is no. I, I, I humbly agree with that. And I see a lot more technology pieces being argued uh, on a daily basis. And, mm-hmm. you know, especially with the dime model. So diplomatic, you had mentioned in your book that uh, we're skewing more towards the M and the dime model as opposed to the, the D or the E or the I. Um, do you want to touch on that a little bit as well? Well, what I was referring to in the book was... Uh, that was during the last administration. Uh, the the State Department was really on the ropes. The, they had lost about a third of their people and a third of their budget, uh, while the military budget was going up into astronomical levels. Uh, and just if you should, all you have to look back is it rather than take the serious effort to use diplomacy. I mean, we could have been doing a lot more diplomacy on Ukraine three or four years ago. That that may have made a difference. Um, I could go all the way back to, you know, the the abrogation of the ABM treaty back in in whenever it was, 2000 something. the, the uh, m- getting out of the intermediate nuclear forces agreement, the INF treaty, you know, abrogating the open skies treaty. Uh, it, it just seemed as though we were, you know, throwing diplomacy to the wind mm-hmm. and then threatening, you know, in the UN and other places to, uh, to use nuclear weapons. So it was just, uh, that's kind of where I was going in the book that we were, we're shunting diplomacy aside in favor of a strong military. Mm-hmm. Not that we shouldn't have a strong military, but we should also use diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you there, sir, especially because, uh, you know, being in the military. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I see that one first and foremost. Uh, I, I just thought of a quick question, but especially with the E for economic, uh, you know, China's trying to wage an economic war and we're, doing a military war uh how do you see those two kind of intersecting as far as what we talked about earlier with you know that gray zone warfare if you will uh we're playing one deck of cards and they're playing another deck of cards how do you see those merging up uh not in our favor Uh, unfortunately i think if if the conclusion you draw is true then uh i think the economic you know, the economic card affects the people. Mm-hmm. Whereas the military card, the only way it affects the people is they have, people end up having to pay for it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, over time, they, and, you know, it's, it's sort of a passe to say, you know, they think the long game. Yeah. And, and over time, you know, having a strong economy and, and pushing on the economy rather than on the military side, I think will, we'll, you know, they could very easily come out ahead. Um, time will tell. So, yeah, time will tell. Yeah. Uh, speaking of time, uh, the you, you had one really interesting part, which made me think a lot about um, instant versus lagging communication, especially with advanced technology and 
throughout wars, obviously technology gets better, but also our speed of communication gets better. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned about we have that lack of reflectional period, whereas, you know, World War II, you'd have to write a written correspondence, give it to a courier, maybe go on a boat, then get to wherever it needed to go. And there was time for that breathe in, breathe out moment, whereas mm -hmm. now uh, communication is instantaneous and you keep having people making decisions like that without that natural human reflection thought process or bouncing ideas off of other people. Can you go into that a little bit as well, please? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's not much more that I can say than, than what I've said, but um, one of the examples that I use in the book uh, which I think was uh, just a wonderful, if you've never read it, there was a book called We Were Soldiers Once and Young. Uh, it was made into a movie, actually, with Mel Gibson. And it was about uh, uh, Colonel Hal Moore and the young, I forget what valley in Vietnam. Uh, terrible, terrible battle. Uh, many, many of his soldiers were killed. But he was there with them, and periodically he would. He was always on the front line, but periodically he would step back into his hooch and just think. And what he was thinking about was not only what was happening, but what wasn't happening. And so he was trying to reflect on the, you know, what was going on. And then he would go out, and it turns out they with they held the the hill, you know, lost a lot of people, but. Uh, so the idea of reflection, um, things are so fast and, and, you know, the communications is so fast to ships out at sea, for instance, they're, you know, they're connected to Washington. Everybody's connected to Washington, but, uh, and there's always a demand for rapid action. One of the other examples I use in the book is just a made up example of a, of a lieutenant and his crusty old sergeant uh, coming up on a situation when the lieutenant says, well, you know, all the computers tell us this is what we're supposed to do. And the sergeant says, but lieutenant, I've seen this before. I think this is what's going to happen. And sure enough, you know, the wrong decision was made and somebody got killed. But since that opportunity to stop and think and gather just a little bit more information before you pull the trigger, uh, I think that that's probably true of all situations, not just war situations, but, you know, giving just a little bit of thought before you run your mouth off is always a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes even just, uh, you know, work for myself, just sitting on a situation for maybe overnight, you know, get one, it gets rid of the emotions. I know we're talking about two different things here now, but um, then I come back in the next day, my, my head's clear. Uh, there's no emotion tied to it and I'm able to make a more clear decision and perhaps bounce some ideas off of other people to see, you know, gauge left and right boundaries and then make that decision. And that's just not as possible. So I do, I do make the point, and, and this is really for people in the military, this, I, I understand the situation, that you know, in a defensive situation, you know, incoming missiles, you don't want to think. You just want to shoot back. Right. Uh, but if it's a question of, of not defending yourself, but uh, returning, you know, uh, reattacking, that doesn't have to be instantaneous. It can take just a little bit of time. Yes, sir. So. Um, yeah, that's uh, actually about all I have. Do you have any uh, parting words and also, uh, you know, how people can get the book? Um, I, I know I personally resonate a lot. Uh, I don't have as much time to read with three kids under the age of seven, uh, but I do have a long commute to work. And uh, I really appreciate the audio book coming out and that's how I'm able to chug through books and I'll read a book every now and then before bed. But by that time, I'm very tired. So <laughs> I just want to say thank you for making an audio book. I feel like anybody who puts out a book should have that alternative because, uh, you know, you are alienating half your audience if there is no audio book as well. So well, Notre Dame Press was a very good press to work for. 
Yeah. So they were they were great. As far as uh, uh, parting words, you know, first of all, I'd like everybody to read the book mm -hmm. uh, to pay more attention to the military. I, I, I've often said, you know, I you know I'd love the when people thank me for my service and those kind of things. That's really a nice, but it isn't enough, mm -hmm. really. I I'm. You want to show respect to something, you try to understand it, right? And I think a little more understanding of uh, the military uh, and maybe even questioning of the military uh, could be a good thing. Uh, I, again, that's, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my 32 years. Uh, I do it all over again. Uh, that's good to hear. And, and I, and I just, you know, I really have a, a deep seated feeling for the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that we, we ship off to fight these wars and, you know, they go. Yes, sir. So anyway, that, those are my, my parting comments. So. And last thing for me, uh, aside from your own books, sir, what, do you have a favorite book? Well, you've already mentioned it. Uh, the, the history of the Peloponnesian War. I've read that probably three or four times. And each time I do, I find something else in it that, uh, that is worth reading. Uh, and there are probably a dozen others, uh, some interesting novels, but uh, no, that, that's my favorite, I think. That's good to hear. I got it on the bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, sir, I sure appreciate your time. Uh, Mr. Latif, and uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge to the future generations and codifying it down in the book and giving me different perspectives to think about as well. So I really appreciate your time, sir. Happy to do it. Thank you.